Okay, so now we are going to come to the problematic thinking errors. These are lies, root lies that we believe about ourselves, that when they get locked into our belief system, they cause serious problems in our emotional state, which drives our behavior. So as a result, it's very necessary to have a look at these things. While we are working through this list, listen to me, while we are working through this list, when there is something that really makes sense to you in terms of it being or having been part of your life style, when, in other words, we come across a problematic thinking error and the red flags go up, list it, so that at the end of the 36, you can sit with a short list of about five or six or seven of them that we know we've got to spend time talking through during therapy itself. Okay? So this is an addition to your life story. Okay? This is the root. The life story gives us a, a, a basic background of where you are coming from and the things that impacted on your life. But now we're going to see how it is impacted on your life and when it is impacted upon your life. A lot of the stuff we see coming out in your behavior. We see people with anger problems. We see people with fear problems. We see people with reject rejection problems. With inferiority feelings and stuff like this. And this is what we're going to be dealing with now. All right. So, the 36 of them. Basically what we're saying, you're wrong. But that's okay. You can blame it on your ignorance. Not after these sessions. You are not going to be ignorant after these sessions. You're going to know where you are at. And remember one thing. One day, you will stand before the Lord to give an account of your life. I'm not going to stand before the Lord to give an account of your life. You are. And we can give you all the information. But if you prefer to ignore it, it's not going to make any difference at the end to the outcome because the Lord is going to give you a very, very clear and distinctive playback as to what has happened in your life. Don't ask me how the Lord does this. We know from our technology that just about everything that is worthwhile being recorded nowadays in a city is being captured on video and is kept for a certain amount of time and security people and all sorts of people can go and check up. And Big Daddy is just about checking all our moves. Now Big Daddy hasn't got the technology that our Father in Heaven has got. We're just learning from Him. So every single word that we have ever spoken has been recorded in Heaven. So one day when we stand before the Lord and we put up our little arguments or we put up our little excuses the Lord is just going to instruct some angel there, play the, press the playback button, you're going to see exactly what happened on that particular day when the Lord confronted you with the information you needed to make an adjustment in your life. And there's going to be no excuse. Okay? So he got us. Can't blame it on our ignorance anymore. A hyperactive mentality. We know now that psychologists and psychiatrists are diagnosing kids with ADD and ADHD. And that the root cause of their diagnosis is found in hyperactivity. In other words, hulle kan nie in die klas stil sit nie. Hulle kan nie concentreer nie. And now they try and write it up as a disease for which they want to prescribe medication which we know is Ritalin. But is that really where the problem is? The problem is in the child's thinking. Let's have a look at how we can identify hyperactivity. He wants action. He wants to move when bored. And has a high level of mental activity directed to a flow of ideas about what would make life more exciting. If there's an escape, hey, everybody is vibing. Everybody is excited. The eye, oor blink, and I'm over net gaan vang. 
because there was something exciting happening. We've been programmed by DVDs and by movies, especially the action movies, to want to see some serious action all the time. It caters for a hyperactivity mentality. If you go and look at the TCM movies, Turner's classical movies, the old classics, Hello, Prat Irelank. Now, those are movies that you always won't check at all. Why? Because there's no action. You've got to pay very careful attention to the dialogue. Because in those days, the movies were all about the interrelationships between people and their minds and their communication and their emotions and stuff like that. So there was a lot of dialogue. Nowadays, there's very little dialogue. Actors just have to be very flexible, mobile, and be able to move quick. Then they make it in the movies. And what does that do? That creates in our minds a hyperactivity. We want to see things. We want to hear things. There must be movement all the time. And if there isn't, we create some. He does not know how to cope with repetition and routine and is easily bored. That is why we have a siren that goes off every so many hours to announce the next activity on the program. That is why we give you jobs that are repetitive, that are boring, that you've got to do over and over and over so that we can get rid of this hyperactivity mentality. So that you can learn that there is also a lot of merit in being able to do something on a routine basis because life is not just full of excitement. Life consists mostly of routine jobs that have to be carried out every day in a specific way. And if you can't tune your mind to accept that kind of work situation, you're going to get easily bored, you're going to change jobs, you're going to have a CV as long as your arm, and eventually people are not going to employ you anymore. And then you're going to look for excitement, and you're going to create it in the wrong direction. Most of you have already. How do we create it? Redistribute your energy into productive tasks and fulfill all routine responsibilities first. Daarom sê ons veel in die ochend as jy opstaan, maak jou bed op, maak jou omgeving skoon, posel jou tanne, was jou gezicht, pak jou kleren weg, etc. etc. A lot of you guys grew up in homes where your mothers did it. Or where there was a domestic servant to do it for you. So you never learned to do it yourself. All you did was jump out of bed, grab a cereal on the way out, and off you go to go and play. You thought life consisted of playing. Life doesn't consist of playing. Life consists most of the time of routine responsibilities. Okay. Develop self-discipline. Teach appreciation for small tasks well executed. So one of the things that we do in occupational therapy, give you a job like laying a piece of paving and see how well you can do it and when you stand back and watch it and say, hey, I did a good job here. Or wacht a bykie, die ding is skeef. Kom ons doen om oor. Kom ons doen om weer oor. Weer oor, totdat ons om recht doen. There is a right way to do things and there is a wrong way to do things. We want to teach you how to do things the right way, even if it means breaking it down and building it over and over and over until you get it right. It's, that's the issue. The issue is teaching you that everything has got its order. Everything has got its discipline. And it's for your mind to fit into with that thing's discipline. I remember I met a little black dude. Uh, uh, his name was Happy down in Hout Bay. When I made my very first attempt at opening up a rehab, must have been 1971, there were a lot of hippies around, people were sleeping in the streets, etc., etc. And I got this place where I could open up a centre, it was at the foot of the 13th Apostle in Out Bay. And I was busy putting up crosses outside when this little black dude came along. Those were still the days when you had to have a pass to move from one place to the next place. And he was illegally around, but he was saved. And he was like a prophet that lived in the mountains. And he was sent by the Lord to come and fetch me to take me up the mountains because the Lord wanted to teach me something up there in the mountain. So I ride up there with him. And we got to the top of the 13th Apostle. There's a cave there. And we moved into that cave. 
and we were going to break firewood. And I immediately went out and I break net takke and I gaan te keer. And he says, whoa, 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 that's not the way to do things. First of all, we go and break all these little small dry branches. And we pack them nicely in the heap. Then the next size, then the next size, then the next size. Eventually when we were finished, there was a whole, a whole string of wood like this. That was orderly and in, 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 in a strict way packed out. Next thing we had to level the cave. So we could sleep in the cave. And I grip net clip along the rags and he says, no, 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 no. God has got every stone prepared that we have to lay here. He said, go and fetch me that one. Bring me that one. Bring me that one. By the time that we were finished, you could see all these stones fitted in perfectly like a jigsaw. And the thing was a flat level. What did he have to teach me? That there was patience and that there was an orderly discipline that the Holy Spirit wants to teach us. And the main thing that he taught me there, or he told me that I had to learn, and I'm still busy learning it, is patience. Patience. There's no amper 40 jaar later. Yeah, there is 40 jaar later. I'm still learning facets of patience. I'm still impatient in certain areas of my life. Okay. So how do we correct it? Develop self-discipline. Teach appreciation for small tasks well executed. Now you know why we got workstations. What's the scriptural application? Where do we read it out of the Bible? Paul the Apostle said in Philippians 4.11 Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. Contentment brings peace. The opposite of peace is what? Restlessness. And how does restlessness manifest itself? In hyperactivity. Grijp hier, grijp daar, grijp dit, and then eventually... At the end of the day, you, you thought you've done a whole lot of things, but when you sit down and you look at what you've actually done, you see you've accomplished very little. Whereas if you take a task at a time and you finish it off well, you're going to find out you're going to be a lot more productive than rushing here, rushing there, rushing there, and doing all this haphazard and halfhartig. All right. Rather than being hyperactive and energy driven, be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 To be filled with the Spirit means to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit has filled you up, He will control all the different facets of your life. Right? And He will direct you to tell you what He wants you to do. Because do you think that God just runs this universe by chance, it's all very well ordered. Everything has got its place. Everything has got its own discipline. And that's why we have such a thing called science. Ne? And when you go and analyze science, you see that it's made up of small bits of information that logically fit together to complete a specific subject. And we can study it and it's always the same. It doesn't change. And when we come into that realization and we start plugging into God in that way, in the way in which He does things, it brings peace inside ourselves. It brings a restless restfulness inside ourselves. Because now we know it's no longer me that's got to keep the universe going. God is in control. He's also in control of me. And He's now able to direct my thoughts according to His will. And I get the things done that need to be done for the day. Okay. Basically a person does not break the law because he is bored or angry, but because he is irresponsible. Unhappiness, for example, is not a cause, but a companion of irresponsible behavior. Just think about it. When you were hunting mal. Just doing your thing. How happy were you really? Or were you chasing after happiness? Were you looking for something? Yes, you were. Now that you found the Lord, and now that there's order coming into your life, and discipline coming into your life, there's a restfulness. 
there's a happiness. You can be at peace. Happiness occurs most often when we are willing to take responsibility for our behavior. Number two, fear. These fears are widespread, persistent and intense. Especially the fear of being caught for something. Fear of injury or death. Or fear of being put down. In other words, being made look like a fool. Right. The correction. Learn to use fear constructively as a guide for responsible living. Fear of the Lord, and that does not mean in terror of the Lord, but reverently and respectfully getting your attitude right with the Lord because of who He is. That's the fear of the God. Respecting Him. Being in awe of His power. Knowing that you're dealing with someone who is far greater than what you are. That's a healthy fear. Now when you start with that, that is the beginning of wisdom. So the moment that you start taking notice of your actions and your thoughts, and you're comparing them to the will of God, because you fear Him, because you respect Him, because you know He's all-powerful and He sees everything, that's when real deep down change starts taking place in your heart. When you are constantly aware of whatever you're doing, whatever you're saying, <coughs> excuse me, whatever is going on on your inside, God is intensely aware of and taking note of it. That's when real change takes place. Not just the fear of being caught out. The fact that you know that when no one is watching, God is. And how are you behaving in His presence? That's when you start overcoming your fear of punishment, your fear of judgment, your fear of people. Why? Because when you are obedient to the Lord, what have you got to fear from man? Nothing. Because God will sustain you. The biblical history teaches us that. All the guys whose lives were threatened by kings because they would not, were not prepared to worship this idol or that idol or the other idol. These guys, when they were, when they were threatened with a fiery furnace, they couldn't care whether they get burnt or not. Their fear for the Lord, their respect for the Lord was greater than their fear of man. And they knew that if they are obedient to the Lord, whatever people do to them, it's going to have no effect upon them. What matters to them is how does God see the situation? How are they behaving in front of His presence? And as a result, we saw the miracles taking place. The lion's mouths being shut and the guys walking around in the furnace with number four that nobody knows where number four comes from. It was the Lord Himself that was there with Him. Okay. So fear can be, can preempt, can preempt injurious action and act as an incentive for self-improvement. That is why we teach you consequences. You must know that if you're going to bust out of this place and you're going to run away, somehow, somewhere along the line, you're going to cut, get caught again. And what is going to happen? There's going to be a consequence. Any cloppers thought that when he's going to hang into this program, yeah, for six, seven, eight, nine, or ten months, we're eventually going to get tired of him and we're going to tell his people, take him. Well, we did get tired of him, but we didn't tell his people to take him. But when they did come and take them, we told them, listen, this guy, if he does not want to respond to this program, he belongs behind bars. So now it's a good couple of months later. Some of you guys don't even know any cloppers. But what is the result? He left. He backslid. He started using again. He's causing trouble now. And what does his family have to come and do? Get a letter from us. So that he can be put behind bars. Now he's going to spend a long stretch behind bars. Why? Because he was not prepared to submit himself to the fear of God. Thought he was going to get away with it. You're not going to get away with it. 
You might get away with it for the next 10, 15 years. But the day when you kiss out and you have not come to the point where the fear of God is more important than any other fear, you're going to face him. And then fear is going to come upon you and it's going to be too late. Too late. Then it's not two or three months in solitary. It's not six or seven years behind bars. It's eternity in the fiery pit of hell. And that's not going to be a nice place to be. Okay. So fear is a good thing if used properly. <laughs> What's a scriptural application? What do we, where do we find this in the Bible? Understand what causes fear. For example, one may have a fear of authority, which most of you had. However, according to Romans 13, verses 3 and 4, if we are not doing anything wrong, we should not fear those in authority, because they are given to us for our protection and safety. This very self-same scripture is one of the things that turned my mind around flat out, 180 degrees. When a cops locked me up there in... in, in uh, in RPS put dam in solitary, just before I went in, that warrant officer told me, when you get a Bible, read Romans chapter 13. The guy didn't know me from a bar of soap. When I got a Bible, I opened up. First place I went to was Romans chapter 13. What did it speak about? God has appointed people in governments all across the world. Some of the governments are fair, some of the governments are not fair. But their police force... Their armed forces carry weapons of destruction in order to bring judgment upon people who are in rebellion against authority. And the Lord spoke to me. Because all those years, as far as my mindset was concerned, the cops were enemy number one and I had to avoid them at every cost. But I was playing games with the cops. Now suddenly I realized these oaks in the SAP they're servants of God. Many of them don't even know him. They're not at all aware of the fact that they're serving God. But when Romans chapter 13 convinced me of God's authority and the people that God has placed in government over us, and that if I, if I am behaving myself and I'm, I'm honoring the laws of the country, I'm not breaking any laws, I've got nothing to fear from these people. So I had to make a mind switch. And I was confronted with the fact that if I change my mind concerning the cops and concerning my position as far as the laws of the country is concerned and I'm acting as a criminal, I've got to do something about my connections that are still continuing acting as criminals. And you know what the Lord required for me to do? To bust them. So 26 full scab pages of information went towards sunup. When I came out, I spent four years doing undercover work, infiltrating syndicates and busting people. Why? Because I suddenly realized that I was completely on the wrong side of the law. And even though in my criminal activity, my fear and respect for the cops had turned into disdain and it turned into disrespect and it turned into Nevertheless, in the back of my mind, I knew somewhere along the line I'm going to come short. And where was I coming short? In terms of God. And when I changed my mind as far as that is concerned, my entire life changed around. Okay. We should not fear those in authority because they are given to us for our protection and safety. Now I work very closely with the cops. First Peter 3, 13 and 14 says, And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are you, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Now, a striking example of we, we saw of the, the, the apostles themselves, every single one of them suffered for righteousness sake. They were thrown in prison, they were beaten, they were executed. Why? Because they preached the gospel. Did they have fear of death? No. They knew. That if these guys put them to death, they're going to be with the Lord. In fact, some of them were looking forward to it. Their, their, their attitude at the moment of death was the same as that of Jesus. 
Father, don't hold this against them. Why? Because they knew they were leaving a good place to be in a much better place. So death to them wasn't an issue. They were, were being translated from a fraught worldly kingdom into a perfect heavenly kingdom. Anybody would want to go there. Okay. Fear. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now this scripture is very necessary for you to memorize. If <coughs> you wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, and the demons have been having a full go at you, and now you're afraid to go back to sleep because you're afraid that if you open the moment you close your eyes, these demons are going to be back on you, they're going to smother you, they're going to give you bad dreams and a whole toot. Especially if you get to the point sometimes where you feel you're going to lose your mind. We're going to freak out. I don't know if you guys ever experienced that. I experienced it a lot. I thought, yeah, vandaag verloor ek dit. I quoted the scripture. Why? Because my spirit man had to speak to my psychological man to tell him who is in control of the mind. The spirit is in control of the mind. No longer Aru Krieger met al sy malgoed. That guy has died according to Romans 6. He's no longer in charge. There's now a new person inside me in charge of my life. And that person is one with the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and when I listen to him and I put into practice what the scripture tells me about my mind, my mind is a sound mind. It's a powerful mind. It's the same as Christ's mind. That's what the scripture teaches. And that's what you need to tell yourself when you feel you're losing it up here. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Romans 8.15 Fear is a form of emotional bondage. In fact, fear is the exact opposite of faith. Now we know that faith brings freedom and liberty in the Holy Spirit. Fear, therefore, is going to bring bondage in the emotions and in the mind. Can you see that? 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. Now, what this scripture basically means is very, very simple. Everybody knows Sooner or later there's going to be a judgment day. And some people are in fear of judgment day. But when your relationship with God is what it should be, you have no fear of God. Not in the sense of God is going to come down heavy upon me. Or I don't know what my life is going to be. You can rest in the Lord because God is in control of your life. Right? So that takes away the fear. At the same time, when I'm beginning to live the love life, I love God and I love my neighbor as I love myself. My fear of man will also disappear. Because I know whenever I'm reaching out to a fellow student, how obnoxious or how cattish he or she might ever be, if I'm reaching out to that person in the genuine love of Jesus Christ, I have no fear of that person. Because the love that I'm projecting is going to overcome the anger, the resentment, the bitterness, the hatred that is coming from that person. Because love is stronger than hatred. By far. As is God stronger than Satan. By far. So if I'm acting in the spirit of fear, I have no fear of man. If I'm acting in the spirit of love, I have no fear of man. That's why David had no fear of Goliath. He knew. The worst that Goliath can do is chop off his head. If he chops off his head, he's going to be with Jesus in any case. But because he was standing up for what is right, he knew God was going to back him up. So he could go into the battle loving God so much that he was prepared to take down the enemy. What is it that causes people to fight with one another. Is it people? Or is it a spirit operating behind people? 
Ask yourself the question. How am I going to stop malice, anger, resentment, jealousy, and all these negative emotions from floating around on this property? By loving people. By loving your fellow student. As a graph of a kid. You are awfully quiet. A six-point program to overcoming fear might be one, limit, restrict fear-inducing mental input. Listen, you can't expect to overcome fear if you can expose yourself to flippin' horror movies and vampire movies and all this demonic trash all the time. That stuff has been produced to instill fear in people's lives. You know these guys that take part in this program, the fear factor. They're mad. They're crazy. You don't overcome fear by doing ridiculous and dangerous things. That's irresponsible. You don't overcome your fear of snakes by going and sleeping in a pit full of poisonous snakes. That's madness. That's the flesh acting there. You avoid them. You're not going to overcome obnoxious people by living amongst them. You avoid them. Now, yeah, in this place, you've all been thrown into the same place. But for what outcome? This is not a, this is not a junk colony. This is not a place where a bunch of junkies are shacking up together. This is a place where people are learning how to follow Jesus Christ. So the motivation for being here is completely different. And how are you going to overcome your fear of the people that you're here with? By loving them. Simple as that. Okay. If you're going to talk drug talk, I can assure you, you are going to increase the fear of relapse. You're going to talk yourself into a relapse. But if you're quoting scripture and you're praying to the Lord, your fear of relapse will completely disappear. Speak to yourself in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Because it builds you up in your faith. You hear yourself speaking in psalms. You hear yourself repeating scripture. You hear yourself singing. A bang mens is nie a mens wat loop en sing nie. Bang mens loop tjoep stil, kyk mooi rond, wie gaan my sien. Number three, pray. Lay your fears before God. Release them to Him. You can talk to Him about your fears. He will help you. Audit your fear responses. Check whenever there is a emotion of fear that's rising up inside you, check your thought life. What have you been thinking? Focus on yourself as a person, not on your performance. Who are you in Christ Jesus? If you start saying, I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, you know what's going to happen? You're going to conquer everything that previously got you down. But if you look at your mistakes that you've made and you keep on focusing on that, you're going to repeat them. Jy sien mos hier so wanneer die oons daar dier die karoe rui. En hulle raak in die slaap en hulle skrik wakker. Daar kan een windpomp of een flippend boom langs die pad staan. Hy ou rui in hom vast. Of hy rui in die pale vast. Daai pale is so dun. En tussen die pale is daar 50 meter spasie. Maar prachtig hy rui in die pale vast. Hoekom? Want die oomlik toe hy sy oor oopmaak, hy dink, jes, ek moet nie in iets vast rui nie. Wat kyk hy? Hy kyk vir die pale. Waar gaat hy in? Na die pale toe. Instead of looking for the gap, and heading for the gap, he heads for the thing that he's afraid of striking, and what happens? He strikes it. Where the mind goes, the man follows. 
Write that down. Where the mind goes, the man follows. So if your mind is focused on fear, fear is going to cause problems for you. If your mind is focused on faith, faith is going to get you out of your problems. Number six, replace fear with love. Simple, straightforward. Six point program. Okay. Number three, inferiority. Minderwaardigheid. Feeling inferior when you're next to other people. He sees himself as a zero, an absolute nothing, a complete failure. The swart scarp van die familie. This is a periodic experience. It, it repeats itself every couple of years. You start seeing a pattern in your life. And sometimes it happens at the same time of the year. It is a feeling of absolute worthlessness and futility. You start asking yourself the question, what is life worth living for? These people normally, seriously, consider suicide at some stage or another in their lives. His greatest fear is that he is nothing and he compensates by attempting to prove he is everything. You find this a lot amongst really bombastic people. People that are really groot praters. Inside, they suffer from inferiority. So they're overcompensating. Correction. Learn to see yourself as others see you. Lower your unrealistic expectations and goals. In other words, if you set yourself goals, make sure that they are realistic. If for argument's sake, one day you want to run a center like this, Realize that at least you have to finish the program. That will earn you a certificate. Once you have a certificate, then you're going to have to study for a year to earn a diploma. The diploma will qualify you to become an intervention counselor. The intervention counseling will soon tell you whether or not this industry is for you because you'll be the first person to go and see people that have got a drug problem. And you're going to have to try and persuade them to come into a center like this or to find professional help from a biblical therapist, somebody that can really help them. If you really do that and you enjoy doing it, then you know this industry is for you. Then you can embark upon your further studies. Then you've got another two to three years of earning a BA degree before you can become a biblical therapist. A biblical therapist is somebody who's going to work at a center like this doing therapy. But now you have to do that for a period of time. And you're going to have to learn all the different facets of a center. The TLC department, the outside, the girls, the, the finances, the food, the purchasing, the storage, the security. There's a whole lot of other things that you're going to have to learn on top of the therapy. Before you'll be in a position where you can run a center like this. So what are you looking at realistically? You're looking at at least five years of intensive study. And you're fortunate. Because it took me 20 years to gain the knowledge that you can now gain in five years. See what I'm saying? That's a realistic expectation. If for some reason or another you're in your late 30s, and you've gone from one job to the next job to the next job and you're really qualified in very little and you think you've done so great but in most of your jobs you were fired or you didn't last there for more than three or six months don't think that you're now qualified as this, that, 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 that and the other you haven't qualified in a single thing because you never saw it through you never finished it you never got the necessary qualifications in that specific area so you've got to have realistic expectations of your life after leaving a center. You're not just going to leave out there and walk into a 20,000 rand a month job with a company car and pension plan and, and alcohol 
And in the meantime, you've spent a year inside a rehab where you've been there for drug issues. You know? I mean, I was, I was fairly high up in the corporate world when I landed in jail. And I knew, I knew, I had the sense enough to know that when I come out of jail, there's no more Anglo-American jobs for me. There's no more Motorola jobs for me. There's no more Nestle jobs for me. Because the moment I get a job application form, they're going to ask me, where were you? Have you got a criminal record? Did you take drugs? And because I'm a Christian now, I can't lie. And I know the company policies of these companies. They don't employ ex-guys that have been in jail. They don't employ ex-drug dealers. They don't employ people that have been on drugs for so many years. So I knew those job markets have closed down for me. I'm not going to get them. Now, of course, in the new South Africa, I can now qualify to become state president, you know, because I've got quite a criminal record behind me. <laughs> Things have changed a bit. But then, of course, if you've got the wrong skin color and you haven't got the right surname, you also got a problem. Then you must not go find work in, in London. Correction. Learn to see yourself as others see you. Lower your unrealistic expectations and goals. Make rational decisions. Learn to believe that feelings of worthlessness are temporary. It doesn't last forever. You'll, you'll get over it. You'll start doing a couple of things right and you'll feel different about yourself. Scriptural application. Now this is what is important. Recognize who you are in Christ. You can draw a line in your CV. And you can write there, BA. Born again. New life. New qualifications. New employer. Now God is my employer. I went from one place to the next place to the next place after I came out of work, out of job, out of jail. Trying to find myself a job. Only thing I could go into was full-time commission sales. Those guys don't care what you've been doing as long as you bring in the, the figures. But then I found out that these guys are finicking me with my commission. Why? Because they don't legally employ you. So you can't go to the Department of, of Labor and lay a complaint when they do you in with your commission. And I was complaining to the Lord about this one day. I had some Christian guy that I went and did marketing for and I sold a whole lot of security systems for this guy. Got him into a new, completely higher level of the market. He appointed me Kamstag as his marketing manager with a sales team underneath me and I thought, hey, no gonna geld mark. And I had a couple of people out there and I taught them how to go and sell to the white lawyers there in Waterkloof. And the sales figures were coming in and coming in and coming in and they, he, we were generated three months of a lot of sales. The guy owed me a phenomenal amount of commission. And what did he do? He liquidated his company. Liquidated his company and he started another company under another name doing exactly the same thing. Got a new team of guys in because they had now been taught a whole new system. And all the hard work that I did gone down the, down the tubes. I went to the Department of Labor. They said, where's your letter of appointment? I said, here's a whole lot of correspondence I wrote as the marketing manager. He said, sir, if you don't have a letter of appointment, telling you what your leave pay is going to be, telling them what your rate of commission is going to be, etc., 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 from the company on a letterhead, we can't do anything for you. And I complained to the Lord. And the Lord said, well, why do you keep on trusting people for your income? Why don't you come and work for me? I'll pay better than them. And I had to make a mind shift. Oof. And I did. And I've never looked back again. I've never worked again for another man. I've been working for the Lord ever since. And he's done me very good. You see? So, recognize who you are in Christ. You are accepted in Christ. John 1.12 we're talking about a person that had an inferiority complex. We're now talking about a person who has now become a prince or a princess of the Most High God. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Your name has become Israel. It means to rule with God. You are destined to reign. You are destined to rule. You're no longer a peluka. 
The Palooka died with Jesus on the cross. You are a new creature. All things are made new. All things are made new. That scripture says. Now, you have to write scripture and write scripture. And you have to write it. Romans 5. 1. 1 Corinthians 6.20 1 Corinthians 12.27 Ephesians 1.5 Colossians 1.14 and Colossians 2.10 Recognize that you are secure in Christ. First of all, recognize who you are in Christ. Secondly, recognize that you are secure in Christ. Romans 8.1 and 2 Romans 8.28 Romans 8.33 and 34 Romans 8.35, 2 Corinthians 1.21, Colossians 3.3, 3, and Hebrews 4.6. And then recognize that you are significant in Christ. Matthew 5.13 and 14, John 15.1 to 5, 1 Corinthians 3.16, 2 Corinthians 5.17 to 20, and 6 verse 1. And then Ephesians 2.6 and Ephesians 2.10. And Philippians 4.13. So you're not just nobody. Very, very important to study your new identity in Christ. You are now a spirit being clothed with and a mind and a will and emotions that should be under the control of the Holy Spirit, living in a body that God is regenerating every day. The same power that rose Christ from the grave now dwells in your physical body. That's why you can be stronger, healthier, more vigorous than the other guys. That are not in that position. Because you have an advantage. The Holy Spirit is generating your spirit and your soul and your body. Some signs of inferiority are. Compulsive behavior. Demanding or perfectionist attitude. Depression. False pride and ignorance, arrogance at least. Hypersensitivity and self-consciousness. How to improve. Stop judging, blaming and condemning yourself and others. Face your feelings honestly. I want to finish this one. Positive responses to feelings of inferiority. The moment that you feel inferior, you should respond as follows. Stand on what is right from God's point of view. You and the other person both, in most cases, in any case, might be wrong. Go and find out what God says on the matter. Go back to the person that you now feeling inferior to and go put it right from God's point of view. Avoid putting yourself down. Check your self-talk. See what you're telling yourself. Stop making comparisons between people and yourself. Very big NB important. Stop comparing yourselves with other people. You are unique. You've got a unique role to fulfill in the Lord. Recognize that you are significant to God and others. It's not a null of contract. Think, feel, speak and act positively. In that order. Think positively. That will bring you to feel positively. That will bring you to speak positively. And when you speak positively, you'll start acting positively. Learn to accept 
praise from others. Stop being this Janni Jammer dinges. And ek is maar niks nie, ek is nie te wirrem. Jy is nie wirrem nie. Jy is a mens, wat dier God lief gehad is, en wat opgerig is, om eendag in die eeuwigheid saam met om te regeer. En jy is hier bezig om te leer, hoe om te regeer. Accept responsibility, you can control your anger, and your attitude, and your thoughts. Assess and control your thoughts. Avoid over introspection and self analysis. Stop going around analyzing yourself all the time. You're not the judge of who you are. God is the judge of who you are. Leave the judging up to Him. Make corrections in your thinking and behavior. They are linked. Develop an attitude of gratitude. When you are overflowing with gratitude and thanksgiving and praise to the Lord, you've got no time to think about what's a worm is jenny. You can't see yourself as a worm when you start worshiping the Lord. When you start saying to the Lord, thank you for this program that I'm on. Thank you for these lessons that Worm Adu is teaching me. Thank you, Lord, that I've spent some time in solitary that I could come to my senses. Thank you for the shackles on my feet, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're going to stop feeling inferior. I guarantee you that. Because the moment you start expressing gratitude to God, faith rises up on the inside. And where faith is, there's no place for fear and inferiority. Accept your human weakness and learn to lean on Jesus. Groot in beer. We are all men of mud. We've all got weaknesses and failings. Be honest with yourself concerning your weaknesses. Paul was honest about his weaknesses and he came to understand that in my weakness, I lean upon his strength. Therefore, my weakness is my strength because the more I am weak, the stronger he is inside me. And then the Lord's strength becomes your strength. You and God become one more and more and more and the feelings of inferiority don't touch you anymore. Reach out to others. Learn to laugh at yourself. When you see a serious way, you really live in There's a lot of humor in the mistakes that you make. I'm telling you now, God has a lack of sniggle behind his mouth, some, behind his hand sometimes at the nonsense we catch up here. He doesn't, he hates sin, but you know what? The stupid things we do. I'm sure the Lord has a lack of little chuckle with himself. Check your self-talk. Very important. Watch what you're saying to yourself. And pray a lot. The more you pray, the more you spend time with Jesus, the less you're going to be conscious of your own failings. Because you know what? When you spend time with Jesus, He rubs off on you. You hear what I said? The more your time you spend with the Lord, the more you can become like Him. Okay, consider these powerful words of Dr. Hart. You cannot control your feelings directly, only indirectly through your thoughts. I speak as a psychotherapist, and my estimate is that about 75% of psychotherapy delivered across the country is of little value precisely because it focuses too much on past hurts, unmerited self-aggrandizement, and a culture of anger enhancement. It would be a lot more effective if it focused on the present and what a troubled person can do to change unhappy circumstances. In short, change your thoughts first and the desired future.
feelings will follow. Girls, listen to that. Change your thoughts first. And then the desired feelings will follow. Feelings are the consequences, not the cause of our emotional problems. This truth opens up a whole new world of freedom and control for all of us. Finally, no, we're going to stop there. We'll do anger next time. Bye, Dange. Drukkie record button is so sorry, they open record.